Nice. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Gupta and, and Dr. Zagarwal. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, and um, I'm happy to uh, um, to take questions uh, and um, see where we go. So, so I'll be speaking about um, HLH. I'm only going to say hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis once. There you go. So um, I do have a relationship with a company whose drug I will be discussing today. Uh, so uh, in general, I want to really cover sort of three topics, some more in detail than others. Uh, of course, this question of what is HLH is a recurring question, I think is still relevant. Uh, a bit, very little about uh, what we've learned from animal models uh, and more uh, from uh, more recent clinical studies. So, uh, but I'd like to um, put HLH in context. And I think the, the talk you just heard from Dr. Goldbach Monsky, um, Ansky was an excellent talk and, uh, and it's actually a nice um, sort of introduction into this context uh, in terms of how I view primary immune regulatory disorders. So some disorders um, uh, I would call Mendelian disorders of autoimmunity. So these are genetic-ish uh, problems that uh, primarily affect the adaptive immune system uh, and lead to autoimmunity of various sorts. Uh, there's another category of disorders that you just heard about in, in uh, excellent detail. These are these auto-inflammatory or interferonopathy disorders. Uh, these are disorders that are primarily affecting the uh, innate uh, aspect or arm of the immune system, even though they may um, feed back and promote autoimmunity in some contexts. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's another group of disorders that's really distinct from these first two. And I call this these disorders, disorders of T-cell hyperactivation. So they um, are certainly, uh, they're primarily affecting the adaptive immune system. However, uh, it's really not a question of uh, specificity like the disorders of autoimmunity, but it's really a question of control of the intensity of immune activation. Now, um, the diagnostic criteria for HLH have been uh, described for a long, quite a long time now. And so I'm not going to go into the detail here. This is this sort of this laundry list of features has been published for, for many years. Uh, but really what, this, um, uh, what these diagnostic criteria are, uh, are pointing to and sort of uh, trying to identify is really to identify patients with uh, defects in this pathway. So in this, this uh, granule dependent pathway of cytotoxic function uh, you know, that is dependent upon perforin and a variety of other uh, genes to help uh, granules to uh, be delivered to target cells when individuals have mutations in this pathway, this is really sort of the core uh, pattern that we see in patients with HLH. Of course, there is more genetic diversity that's uh, been identified over the years. So in fact, you can categorize genetic lesions causing HLH into really, I would say, four broad categories. So one would be perforin dependent cytotoxicity, which is the pathway shown here. Uh, but there are a variety of other uh, lesions, uh, for the most part, much more rare that affect T cell signaling, but that do not um, uh, impede T cell function enough uh, that uh, can allow this sort of dysregulated uh, T cell response. Uh, there, are, there is in fact some overlap between uh, patients with uh, HLH and those with inflammasomopathies. Uh, and there are specific um, lesions affecting the inflammasome that lead to HLH in, in, uh, in patients. And then finally, there are um, other uh, genes that actually lead to intrinsic um, um, dysregulation of in macrophages themselves. And uh, this is really quite different than um, the other etiologies of HLH. Um, and so, and so uh, many years ago, we, um, uh, after the discovery of perforin as the cause of HLH, we, we began to model the disease in animals to try to understand what's going on. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details because these are all generally published studies. But if we challenge these animals with an infectious uh, challenge, in this case, a virus called LCMV, we saw, we saw that they developed HLH. Uh, and really to summarize things, um, what we found is that, that is that in addition to its previously described function in terms of resisting viruses or resisting uh, infections, uh, this pathway also has a really critical feedback uh, function in the immune system. And when it's missing, it really is uh, an essential feedback loop, a negative feedback loop that's broken. Uh, and so uh, in uh, a bit more detail here, you can see across the bottom uh, papers from our lab and, and from other groups 
uh, defining the pathophysiology of HLH uh, in, in this sort of, um, uh, in these animal models. And in essence, if you lose perforin, you lose this dominant regulatory feedback loop, which leads to heightened antigen presentation, particularly by dendritic cells, which leads to heightened T cell activation, in particular by CD8 T cells, which leads to a variety of, uh, or uh, tremendous increases in a variety of cytokines, uh, but interferon gamma being uh, the most notable amongst them, which ultimately, uh, through its ability to activate macrophages and probably other cell types, leads to HLH. And in essence, what you see is that there is a defect of immune regulation uh, in these patients, but there's also very distinctive interferon gamma driven immunopathology that ultimately is uh, recognizable as the disease itself. Uh, now in humans, the processes or the, the situation is a bit more complicated. Uh, and if you can imagine, uh, there are a variety of different clinical situations in which HLH develops. Uh, and um, the core of the um, uh, of this sort of disease process is familial HLH, these patients that have mutations in the perforin pathway. Uh, but there also are a number of individuals that develop HLH as a complication of a rheumatologic disorder, most commonly juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, but then in addition to that, there are these other um, uh, situations that have been recognized for, literally for decades. And, and the first is malignancy associated HLH. This occurs typically in older children or adults, it's increasingly recognized in adults uh, that really for the most part do not have the same sort of genetic lesions that we see in children. Uh, there also is a uh, well um, um, recognized HLH that can occur as, a, as a, um, a complication of various sorts of immune compromised states, either primary immune deficiency uh, or uh, immune iatrogenic immune suppression. And then finally, even in the context of iatrogenic immune activation, for instance, uh, with CAR T cells, there uh, patients will develop um, um, uh, difficulties such as cytokine release syndrome that actually overlap quite strongly with uh, the, the uh, HLH we see in the familial HLH patients. Uh, and so HLH is a syndrome. Uh, and this, uh, as you might imagine, with a variety of etiologies, uh, and in fact, like any syndrome, um, I, I think we, it's important to distinguish sort of the real disease process, which requires immune suppression in order to treat the patients uh, versus the things that I like to refer to as disease mimics. So in other words, somebody that actually uh, fulfills the conditions of the syndrome, but would really likely not benefit from immune suppression. And this is an area that is still, there's still quite a lot of ambiguity uh, and that we, we really don't understand, but uh, I think we certainly see examples of patients and who, who certainly who meet the criteria for HLH, uh, but in fact are, um, are not, do not benefit or are actually harmed by immune suppression. So, uh, and in fact, if another way to think about um, uh, HLH in humans is that there are a variety of upstream um, etiologic causes for this syndrome. Uh, and what we've studied in animal models is really mostly related to familial HLH. But I think I'd like to persuade you that uh, the commonalities amongst all these patients does suggest that, uh, at least in the majority of them, that there is a, a common pathophysiology that involves T cell activation and interferon gamma, just like we see in, in sort of this, in this core group of patients. Now, um, uh, when we think about um, you know, trying to translate this uh, complexity to humans, um, you know, we, we, it's very obvious that HLH is a, high, is a disorder of inflammation uh, because these patients are by many measures are, are highly inflamed. Uh, but really when you're talking about inflammation, as, as you can see from uh, Dr. Goldbach Mansky's talk, really it can mean quite a lot of different things, right? So I like to say that inflammation is like ice cream. It comes in many flavors uh, and you really need to be more specific. Uh, and in particular, uh, one one um, uh, problem that's been recognized for quite a long time is that patients with HLH can present uh, or typically present with acute inflammation. Uh, and sometimes they can look like patients with sepsis, which is another syndrome, if you will, of acute inflammation. In the case of sepsis, what we think is that most of the time it's caused by bacterial or you know, perhaps sometimes other pathogens. Uh, in the case of HLH, while it may be triggered by infectious pathogens, uh, it's not, that's not really um, always evident. Uh, and we also know that, that um, uh, HLH, at least in terms of familial HLH, um, has a very distinct sort of T cell component. Uh, 
So in terms of predictions from our preclinical studies and from our group and from others, is that we would predict that you know, T-cell hyperactivation, especially CD8 T-cells, should be unusually or extremely prominent in this form of inflammation. Uh, it also should prominently um, um, so suggest interferon gamma. And in fact, interferon gamma should have a disease causal role. And so while uh, clinically, sometimes it is difficult to distinguish patients with sepsis and HLH, at least initially, uh, we thought this would be an interesting comparison group to study. So we, we, uh, we examined um, uh, uh, peripheral blood profiles, and I'm gonna focus on T-cell profiles because these were most informative, uh, from patients with HLH, comparing them to patients with sepsis, uh, as well as pediatric controls. And in the HLH patients, there were, there was a, a mix of individuals either with uh, identifiable familial HLH mutations or without mutations. Uh, also individuals that had identifiable infections or those that did not have infections. Uh, and in the case of sepsis, most of these patients had, uh, but not all, had bacterial infections. And what did we find? Well, uh, the first thing I wanna uh, point out is that um, uh, we know from the animal models that um, HLH is a disease of T cell activation. So not so much proliferation, but actually acute activation. Uh, and the first question we wanted to ask ourselves is, you know, what does recently, what do recently activated T cells look like in humans? Uh, and this actually has been, I think, well-defined in experimental studies in humans. In this case, here's a, an image from a 2008 paper uh, examining um, uh, individuals that um, were subjected to an experimental live virus vaccine, in this case for yellow fever. And what they found is that there was a very nice kinetic uh, of appearance uh, within, particularly in the CD8 population, of cells that were bright for CD38 and HLA-DR. Uh, and these cells came and went with a kinetic that was actually uh, pretty similar to what we would have predicted from uh, experimental studies. So when we looked for a similar population, and I should point out, uh, this uh, sort of population has also been identified in, in, in uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever as well. Uh, and so when we looked for this population uh, in patients with sepsis or those with HLH, what we found is a very prominent uh, recently or uh, activated CD8 population was evident in the patients with HLH but was essentially completely missing in the patients with sepsis. Uh, and if you quantitate this across a number of patients, you can see that it was very, uh, while there were a few patients with sepsis uh, that had some elevations uh, in this population, really it was the, um, the patients with HLH uh, that had this population, whether you're, whether you're gating on simply the 38 bright T cells uh, or the 38 uh, bright uh, HLA-DR double positive cells. Uh, and if you perform um, ROC analysis, you can see that the presence of even a small population, in this case, just greater than 7% of CD8 T cells uh, with these markers was able to uh, very accurately identify uh, patients with HLH from patients with sepsis or healthy controls. Uh, now we're focusing, we focused on CD8 T cells in part because of our preclinical studies. Uh, but the other thing we found is that while we saw similar populations in CD4 T cells, uh, we, uh, if you actually quantitated the number of these highly activated CD8 T cells compared to the highly activated CD4 T cells, we saw that in most patients, there were, there were many, many more activated CD8 T cells circulating. And while the total number of CD8s was not really tremendously uh, um, increased compared to CD4s, if you looked at the number of the, uh, the ones that were highly activated, it was very um, highly skewed towards CD8 T cells. So again, this really um, mimics uh, our, our, sorry, this really, I would say, validates our predictions from the animal models that this is exactly what we would expect. Uh, and so additionally, uh, you know, what about uh, the sort of the potential role of interferon gamma? Uh, and so one thing that's worth pointing out is that interferon gamma is actually, uh, is actually not an easy thing to measure in the blood of patients. Uh, interferon gamma is normally secreted and acts locally from lymphocytes are typically secreting it and they're acting on local cell types. But in response to the um, local sensing of interferon gamma in the tissues, the, many of these cell types will produce um, CXCR3 chemokines. So CXCL9, 10, and 11 that bind to this, uh, the, their, the same receptor. Uh, and these chemokines actually uh, draw in um, other immune cells into sites of inflammation. And so they, they actually function at a distance. And so these are actually readily measurable uh, in the blood of patients. And in fact, they really uh, are a much more sensitive measure of interferon gamma activity uh, 
Uh, and to some extent, if you're looking, by the way, at CXCL10 and 11, they also would be an excellent measure of type one interferon activity. Uh, but when we looked at um, CXCL9 in the plasma of patients, uh, what you see uh, initially, of course, is that with inflammation, with sepsis or SIRS, there is an increase in CXCL9. So this is certainly not a specific measure uh, of HLH, but if you compare patients with HLH to those with sepsis, uh, there is a clear increase in uh, CXCL9. And the other thing that's worth noting is that almost all patients with active HLH have increases in CXCL9 uh, compared to healthy controls, sort of further validating um, uh, the uh, action of interferon gamma in HLH. Uh, and going back to the T-cell phenotypes, if you look at these activated T-cells that we identified in patients with HLH and you stimulate them ex vivo, what you see is that a, a large number of them will produce interferon gamma. They also produce TNF, not shown in the slide here, but again, further demonstrating that the activated T-cells that we see in patients with HLH are, um, are producing interferon gamma. Now, to really test the causal role of interferon gamma and in HLH, you actually need to do neutralization studies like, uh, like were performed in experimental animals. Uh, and in part, um, and this is, of course has been possible as probably most of you are aware, uh, is that because there was a, a monoclonal antibody called imipalumab, which was developed um, largely um, based on uh, sort of preclinical animal studies. Uh, and uh, imipalumab is a, a fully human high affinity antibody that binds to interferon gamma and prevents it from signaling. Uh, it has uh, the unusual, or I would say the slightly unusual characteristic uh, that uh, it doesn't prevent interferon gamma from binding to its receptor. Uh, and so in the presence of high levels of interferon gamma, this antibody, which, you know, like most antibodies has, would uh, in a steady state have a half-life that is approximately three weeks, can have a very short half-life because um, it will bind to the cytokine, which then binds to the receptor and the antibody is internalized and consumed. Uh, and so it, uh, it leads to um, some unusual aspects, like instead of dosing this antibody, say on a monthly or weekly basis, we actually uh, will typically dose it in a highly inflamed patient uh, twice a week. But a, uh, a international study was conducted, uh, that, which is, uh, has been completed and now published called the NIO50104 uh, and a follow-up study called the NIO50105 study uh, that was conducted in the US and Europe, studying children with um, uh, primary HLH. Uh, most of the patients um, were treated in second line. Uh, in other words, they had failed prior therapies for one reason or another. Uh, and, um, uh, what we've uh, found in this patient, so amongst uh, all the patients enrolled, there were 34 patients uh, enrolled on the study, uh, 27 of which were treated as second-line patients. Uh, while the prognosis is not really known in second-line patients, it's generally uh, thought to be uh, worse uh, than, um, than um, patients that don't require any kind of salvage therapy because they demonstrate their, their poor responsiveness to, to uh, primary therapy such as etoposide. Uh, and, uh, but these patients were typical HLH patients with an age, median age less than a year, uh, and, the, and um, uh, the, these patients expressing most of the typical HLH features. The disposition of these patients, so of these 34 patients, uh, 30 patients were alive at week eight, 22 of which underwent uh, transplantation, and 20, but uh, 24 were alive at uh, last follow-up. So just to, uh, to sort of cut to the bottom line, uh, what we found is that approximately a little less than two thirds of these patients demonstrated a response to imipalumab. The responsiveness to this agent was um, variable from really truly excellent responses to I would say very, very minor responses, uh, but clearly demonstrating that interferon gamma plays a causal role in patients uh, with HLH. Uh, and so um, uh, the other thing that I think that was good news from this, um, um, uh, from this study is that uh, the long-term survival of these patients was approximately 70%. Uh, and uh, this is uh, really um, was, uh, I would say, good survival based on historical norms uh, and based on the fact that these were patients that had failed standard therapy, most often with etoposide and dexamethasone. Um, now, in terms of the safety and tolerability, the other good news is that uh, imipalumab appears to be um, a very safe agent. While there were many adverse events amongst these patients with HLH, this was, for the most part, was what I would say is expected amongst this population. Uh, there was one infection that was a histo a histoplasma that led to the discontinuation of the drug, uh, but otherwise um, the drug was, was really very well tolerated. Uh, I should point out that one of the exclusion criteria to be enrolled on the trial was the presence uh, 
of a specific set of um, infections that are known uh, to absolutely require interferon gamma for their control. And that it includes most prominently mycobacterial infections, including tuberculosis and atypical mycobacteria, uh, but also uh, a few other things such as Salmonella, Shigella, uh, and uh, histoplasmosis. Uh, so, but again, confirming um, the uh, prominent role of interferon gamma in uh, HLH, all of the patients had extremely elevated levels of CXL9 at the time of enrollment on the study. Uh, and with treatment with imipalumab, um, uh, they had, um, uh, they suppressed CXL9 levels demonstrating in vivo um, interferon gamma neutralization. Uh, and um, also the, the probability, so not all patients had a complete sort of neutralization of interferon gamma despite dose escalation. Uh, and in fact, the probability of having a response uh, actually correlated quite nicely uh, with the CXL9 levels uh, that the patients uh, displayed at the end of therapy. Okay, so a word about transplantation. So the majority of these patients went on to allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. Uh, and uh, as is, has been known for many years, interferon gamma really has a role or is produced in many types of immune responses and including essentially all cellular immune responses such as uh, rejection or um, allogeneic rejection, certainly. Uh, and um, no experimental evidence uh, suggests that interferon gamma would in fact have a negative impact on hematopoietic engraftment. Uh, and it's known historically that patients with HLH do relatively poorly uh, in allogeneic transplantation for reasons that have not uh, been fully defined. Uh, and uh, you know, one thing in particular I'd point out is that the role of interferon gamma in GBHD is actually quite complex. Uh, there are some experimental studies that per, uh, suggest that it promotes GBHD, well, others actually suggested it can uh, suppress aspects. So it's, it's really an unclear um, sort of functionality. Uh, and so, but we did assess transplant outcomes on the, on the NIO 50105 study. Uh, and, um, and what we found, uh, interesting, oh, first off, I should point out the patient uh, characteristics of the ones that went to transplant. Uh, this was um, uh, a mix of patients receiving either myeloablative or reduced intensity conditioning regimens, as one would expect from an international study uh, conducted across many different centers. Um, but um, I think what's really worth noting is this was a relatively poor risk patient population. About half of the patients uh, had, um, did not have matched donors. So they had mismatched or haploidentical donors. Uh, and uh, reflecting that uh, sort, of, um, sort of poor donor mix, about a quarter of the patients received T-cell depleted grafts which as we know actually is a risk factor for graft rejection uh, uh, or at least mixed chimerism. Uh, and, so, um, and so to summarize data, um, you know, really with, with one slide here, and that is, is that we observed a surprisingly excellent survival in these patients post-transplant. So approximately 90% of the children uh, are surviving long-term post-transplant. So again, this is a relatively small sample size, uh, but, um, and it's notable that the patients that did die uh, were ones that, um, um, for the most part, received haploidentical transplants and, and did not engraft. Uh, but most patients uh, on this study actually were able to engraft, and even with reduced intensity conditioning regimens, uh, maintained good chimerism. Uh, and so we saw excellent survival. And, and while we don't, we don't know that imipalumab played a causal role because of the sample size, I think this is suggestive that, it, uh, that neutralizing interferon gamma will decrease um, complications of transplantation. GBHD, which I don't have a slide for, was occurred at the expected rate, neither increase nor decrease, so probably consistent with previous experimental uh, knowledge. Now, um, I, I'll um, uh, end here with a, a case report, which is, you know, maybe not as important as a, as a prospective clinical trial, but I think it really uh, is um, asked provocative questions. And so, uh, as the, um, the, um, the, um, the community of physicians caring for children with primary immune deficiencies, I'm sure is well aware uh, that um, we know um, what interferon gamma is important for in humans uh, because there are patients that lack interferon gamma receptor. There are also patients that develop neutralizing antibodies against interferon gamma. And so that was, that was really informed the design of the uh, prospective imipalumab trial. Uh, and these patients have increased susceptibility most prominently to mycobacterial diseases but they also um, develop herpes zoster, histoplasma, salmonella infections, 
uh, and, and um, a few others, but these are really some of the most prominent sorts of infections. Uh, experimentally, we know that um, there are certain agents that are not really reported in patients uh, because probably these patients are quite rare that, that should be of concern, things like toxoplasma, even Ehrlichia. Uh, but um, but there are, there's a limited sort of uh, spectrum of pathogens that we concern ourselves with in patients that have um, that lack interferon gamma functionality. Uh, and so, but in general, um, we know that at least with autoantibodies and our experience with imipalumab is that with antimicrobial treatments, these, these um, um, agents can be dealt with, uh, not so much with the genetic, uh, uh, patients with genetic abnormalities of recycling. Uh, but there's one patient we treated and we reported a couple of years ago now that really had quite a remarkable outcome. Uh, and so this was a, uh, an almost two-year-old child who had an EBV-associated HLH that was highly refractory to prior therapies, including rituximab. And he had persistent high-level viremia for greater than two months. He didn't quite meet the uh, criteria for chronic active EBV, but probably with time he would have. But he was really uh, dying of HLH when he was transferred to us. He had severe and prolonged pancytopenia. He had multiple infectious complications after EBV. He eventually had reactivation of CMV, had fungemia and bacteremias, multiple organ failures and injury, including renal failure and, and, and uh, CNS and GI hemorrhages. Uh, and he was so ill that we actually uh, treated him with imipalumab alone. We actually uh, didn't give him steroids because of the fungemia. So he literally had only one um, sort of form of immune suppression. Uh, and what we observed was really amazing. Uh, and the arrow, the large arrow here is where we started imipalumab. Uh, and what we saw is that within about a week and a half, his ferritin, which was essentially unmeasurably high because our lab won't uh, dilute the serum beyond a certain level, uh, began to plummet rapidly. Uh, and around the same time, uh, again, with no specific therapy for EBV, his EBV levels also began to plummet. Uh, and while it did take almost six months for him to clear the virus, on uh, nothing but interferon gamma blockade, he actually eventually cleared EBV uh, on his own. Uh, and he uh, actually recovered from the HLH uh, and um, is surviving to this day without uh, transplantation. So this result, to my mind, suggests that uh, interferon gamma actually may impede immune responses in some contexts, including uh, to viruses. So even though it's widely uh, produced, I think we still have a lot to learn about what interferon gamma is actually doing uh, in, in, the, in many immune responses. So uh, to sort of summarize sort of the therapeutic landscape, uh, you know, historically, uh, we have a few things that we certainly uh, can use to treat HLH, including etoposide, as well as anti-T-cell antibodies such as ATG or alentuzumab. Of course, corticosteroids are, are an essential sort of bedrock to therapy. Uh, but uh, interferon gamma blockade uh, is a viable uh, treatment option uh, emerging uh, in uh, trials ongoing, I would say, uh, include JAK inhibitors, uh, and in some contexts, um, um, perhaps in the case of disorders of uh, the inflammasome, blockade of IL-18, and perhaps other cytokines uh, as well. I didn't have time to discuss those, but those are still, I would say, uh, being tested in humans. So HLH is really a unique type, or is a prototype of a unique um, category of immune regulatory disorders. Uh, this uh, syndrome um, really incorporates uh, complex patient phenotypes, probably with a variety of etiologic associations. Uh, but interferon gamma does appear to be the, the, the key driving cytokine in experimental context. In response to imipalumab has validated this uh, in patients with HLH. Uh, and the interferon gamma appears to uh, contribute to immune regulation in ways that we're still unraveling. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think that uh, this is an area that's gonna be uh, increasingly relevant as, uh, as we utilize interferon gamma blockade. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge the, the, uh, the team uh, that uh, from Novimune and now Sobi that led to the uh, clinical trial uh, um, uh, testing imipalumab. Uh, additionally, uh, individuals in my lab, in particular, Vadana Chaturvedi, who did most of the flow cytometry work I showed you, as well as a number of collaborators uh, that were essential for this work. So thank you.